Good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning and for Benny asking me uh, to do so. We're going to spend some time together today looking at the concept of living a life with no regrets, uh, not missing the important things before they're gone, and being purposeful in the way that we fulfill our Christian duties. Over the last couple of weeks, after uh, Benny asked me to speak this morning, as I comp contemplated what I would speak about, I kept coming back to the concept of how much we miss out on when we don't allow ourselves to be in the moment, concentrating on the right things at the right time. We chase many things. Some of us change, chase uh, shiny objects that allure us. When the most important things are right in front of us, within our grasp, uh, ready for our attention, but we miss it time and time and time again. As I was thinking of this lesson, I, I kept thinking back to a song performed by uh, Kenny Chesney, uh, the country artist, uh, titled uh, Don't Blink. And I think it embodies so much of what I want to develop in this sermon this morning. So listen to these lyrics as I read them to you. I turned on the evening news, saw an old man being interviewed, turning 102 today. Asked him what's the secret to life. He looked up from his old pipe, laughed and said, all I can say is don't blink. Just like that, you're six years old and you take a nap and you wake up and you're 25 and your high school sweetheart becomes your wife. Don't blink. You just might miss your babies growing like mine did, turning into moms and dads. Next thing you know, your better half of 50 years is there in bed and you're praying God takes you instead. And you're, trust me, friend, 100 years it goes faster than you think, so don't blink. I was glued to my TV, and it looked like he looked at me and said, best start putting first things first, because when your hourglass runs out of sand, you can't flip over and start again. Take every breath God gives you for what it's worth. Don't blink. Just like that, you're six years old, and you take a nap. You wake up, and you're 25, and your high school sweetheart becomes your wife. Don't blink. You just might miss your babies growing like mine did and turning into moms and dads. Next thing you know, your better half of 50 years is there in bed. And you're praying God takes you instead. Trust me, friend, 100 years goes faster than you think. I've been trying to slow it down. I've been trying to take it in. In this here today, gone tomorrow world we're living in. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 talks to us about time, and it says, There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up is lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. The man in the song was 102 years old, 102 years of life. More knowledge in his 102 years than several of us put together, and all he could say was, don't blink. At six, he took a nap. At 25, he married. At 75, he lost the love of his life. And at 102, his reflection is that time passes in the blink of an eye. As we look through this this morning, the best way I know to walk you through this is to use personal examples for myself and my family to illustrate what happens when we blink. If we look at 2021, if I look at 2021, I recognize today is August the 1st and seven months of the year are gone in the blink of an eye. I hear lots of people saying that COVID slowed life down for them. That, that wasn't the case for me. I missed a lot of things this year because of other commitments. I missed 39 out of Eli's 40 baseball games this spring. I have missed or will miss three family vacations. A host of late night conversations with Sarah and the kids because I couldn't stay awake any longer because I was engaged in other things. None of this is mentioned to elicit sympathy, but to explain that all these things happen in the blink of an eye. I haven't been pur purposeful enough in changing the outcome of these circumstances. It says 
that life goes faster the older that you get. And boy, does it. I can remember time seeming to stand still when I was a little kid waiting for something big to happen. Several years ago, probably six or seven years ago, Eli said to me on December the 22nd, the next three days are going to take longer for me than the last 362 waiting on Christmas to come. Every birthday goes by with a blur. Many of you can relate. Even though I move slower physically every year, life gets faster and faster and faster. Blink, and you'll miss it. In the 12th chapter of Romans, verses 1 and 2, once again, it tells us what to do with our time. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It tells us what the will of God is, how we prepare ourselves for that which is coming. Much like the panic that is upon us when we aren't prepared for a test, for a presentation at work, for a, uh, an event that's coming up, panic should be upon each of us if we have not heeded Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Present yourself. Do not be conformed. Be transformed. We've been told to, what to do with our time. We actually know what to do with our time. But we often allow distractions to put us in a spot that we hadn't ought to be. It takes us away from what our priorities should be into something else that seems necessary at the time, but it actually is not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. Are we ever vigilant? Do we recognize that there is no warning of His coming? Like a thief in the night, you have to be ready. I have to be ready. Don't blink. Several years ago, we went to St. Louis to uh, watch a Cardinals game. We've been there several times for games, but to this one in particular stands out to me because it illustrates the point of, of not blinking so well. On the way up to our seats, we walked uh, through the concourse, and they have a, a batting cage. And there, Eli's a baseball player, and I thought, how much fun would it be for him to get to swing a bat at a major league ballpark? He'd been watching this a little closer than I had, and when I asked him after I'd bought the 10 pitches if he wanted to step in there, he said, no way. <laughs> and that was the same response from two other able-bodied young men that were with us at that day, and one of them was sitting in the back holding one of my granddaughters. And they both said, no way. And to be fair, the balls aren't really coming that fast. They're only coming at about, uh, you know, 60 plus miles an hour, but they're at 30 feet away from you instead of 60 feet away from you. And so it's like a 90 plus mile an hour major league fastball. And not a one of them was willing to step in. So what to do? I hadn't been in a cage or facing a pitcher throwing over 90 miles an hour in probably 25 years, but one does not waste the opportunity to swing a bat in a major league ballpark. So pitch one, I stepped up, had my batting helmet on, my bat there, and I blinked, and that thing went past me so fast, I barely even heard it. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us we've always got to be ready to make a defense, and I was woefully unprepared for what happened. So pitches two through six, I saw a little bit of improvement. I hit some, some uh, couple of foul balls and squared some up pretty well, and pitch seven was coming my way. And it was going to be my home run pitch. I was going to take one deep. I was locked in. I was ready. I waited. And I waited. If, you, if you've seen this before, the ball drops and it rolls down a tube. And the ball didn't drop. And it didn't drop. And I waited. And about the time I thought there's a malfunction and it's not going to happen, I blinked and that thing shot past me so fast again. And I missed it. You shouldn't blink when you're batting, shooting a free throw, watching a suspenseful part of a movie, driving in heavy traffic, or doing anything that involves intense concentration. 
Blinking is an involuntary reaction. We're doing it as we go along here this morning. We don't have to put a lot of thought into it. We can actually control it when we want to. But to blink or not is based upon the severity of the situation. You've got to maintain your vigilance. You've got to maintain your fervor. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Don't blink. My nature, and some of you know me better than others, especially the ones that live with me, I didn't used to be an overly sympathetic, emotional, or, or open person. Maybe I'm still not, but I am working on it. My heart isn't on my sleeve. I keep my emotions pretty well in check most of the time. But time and experiences have a way of changing things. You lose a few people that you love. You add a couple of grandbabies to the family, and things start to feel a little bit different. One blink a few years ago, seven years ago, this last Saturday to be exact, started this change in me. It was July the 24th of 2014. Early morning, I was driving in bumper to bumper traffic in downtown Denver, headed to the airport. I was on a conference call with the corporate office in Dallas ahead of a flight that I had that morning. And my dad called. Dad often called me early in the morning. He was an early guy, and I was traveling all the time, so I typically had early mornings available to talk. But I was busy, so I ignored the call. And he called again just a few moments later. By this time, he would called a third time, and I was at the rental car center. And so I sent a text that said, hey, I'll call you in a few minutes when I get wrapped up with what I'm doing. I would later find out that it wasn't actually my dad calling. It was my stepsister calling on my dad's phone. And no sooner had I sent that text that Sarah called. And then she called again. And she texted me and told me to call her because it was an emergency. And I called her. And her news was that my dad, who I'd talked to on the phone two nights before, who was a young 64 years old and had many, many, many years of life ahead of him, had passed away unexpectedly during the night. Now that's a gut punch. It takes the wind completely, totally out of you. My family needs me. I'm 12 hours away. A series of rerouting of flights and getting turned around and uh, getting dropped in, in Tulsa and, and uh, making it home. And then the grief and the challenges that, that represents that you've got to deal with as you go along. So much grief in his passing, but many blessings as well. Easier to look at now than it was at that point in time. There's much more that we would have experienced and shared together, but there wasn't a lot left unsaid between us, thankfully. Not everyone is as blessed as that. I, I got to work through the grieving process with a wonderful family. I got to preach my father's funeral. But there's two things that you should take from this. Tie up your loose ends with your relationships, or you might blink and miss that opportunity. The silver lining in all of this, for me, is that my outlook on life has changed for the better. I can look at you, my church family, and have a better ability to be your brother in Christ that I need to be. Every experience, good or bad, can have a positive effect if we will allow it to impact us in a positive manner. In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10, it says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a song called Praise You in This Storm performed by a group called Casting Crowns, and it says this, I was sure by now 
God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen, and it's still raining. And as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain, I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I will praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands, for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You've never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. I remember when I stumbled in the wind, you heard my cry to you, and you raised me up again. My strength is almost gone. How can I carry on if I can't find you? But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain, I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And finally, it says, I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. A direct reference to Psalm chapter 121, verses 1 and 2. So it's easy to say, but it's not easy to do when we face the reality of these challenges. I deal with challenges by relying on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which says to us that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation, He provides a way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. Whatever your struggle, this addresses it and explains that others have struggled and come up on top. Your challenge isn't unique, but God's love for you is. So what is your challenge? Is it hatred? It's covered. Lying? Covered. Anxiety? Covered. Apathy? Covered. Laziness? Covered. Letting grief overtake you? It's covered. Don't blink. One last thought this morning, and this lesson will be yours. And this one concerns me certainly most of all. Revelation 22, 12 says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render it to every man according to what he has done. Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation, without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Mark 13, 32, But of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not the Son, but the Father alone. Matthew 24, 44, For this reason you be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think that He will. Four different admonitions in these four different scriptures. Quickly, eagerly, no one knows. Be ready. Second chances are really hard to come by. Can I say it again? Don't blink. The pitch will get past you. You'll miss your shot. The climax of the movie will be gone. Salvation will slip through your grasp. I look out here this morning at a crowd, and I see some who need to take an opportunity to make things right in their life with the Lord. It all begins with a decision to be made by you. You know, it can be hard, and it's really easy to let the moment pass us by. That's what we've been talking about all morning this morning. I will throw this out there. Tomorrow, you'll feel different than you do right now. When that moment is past, you don't always get it back again. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 tells us several things. It tells us to repent to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't you want that? The gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the greatest story ever told. But your action is required to make sure that you're not part of the saddest story ever told, the condemnation of those who will not obey. I was glued to my TV, and it looked like he looked at me and said, best start putting first things first. 
Because when your hourglass runs out of sand, you can't flip over and start again. Take every breath God gives you for what it's worth. If you need prayers of comfort or encouragement, or you'd like to put Christ on in baptism, or maybe you need to rededicate your life at this time, whatever the need that you have this morning, don't delay and don't blink as we stand and sing. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good?